Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. So I think the thing to remember for a question like this is that percent literally means divided by 100. So we can rewrite the question as 125 over 100 multiplied by 5. In case you didn't know, the word of can be translated into multiplication. So one way to solve this is to reduce by a common factor of 25 there, so you end up with 5 quarters and then say 5 quarters times 5 is 25 quarters and 25 quarters is 24 plus 1 over 4 which is 6 plus 1 fourth or 6.25 so that's one way to solve it. Another way to solve it going back to 125 over 100 times 5 is to multiply 125 times 5 and then divide by 100. So for some people maybe this is a better option depending on your strengths and weaknesses. So how would I do 125 times 5? I would think of it as 100 plus 20 plus 5 times 5. So I would be multiplying each of them individually by 5. 100 times 5 is 500 20 times 5 is 100, and 5 times 5 is 25. So you end up, I'll just put it here on the left side, you end up with a total of 625 over 100, and now you just stick the decimal point in the appropriate position, and you get answer choice E. So uh, I'm just curious, let me know uh, for each of you which approach resonates more with you. Number one, so the first one I did where we divide by 100 first and then multiply by 5, or number 2, where we multiply the numbers and then divide by 100 in the end. My, my guess is that many more people will prefer approach number 2, because dividing by 100 is so easy to do with the decimal system. Right? You literally just stick the decimal point in the appropriate position. Uh, so if the denominator is 100, it may be a good idea to leave that till the end, to leave that dividing by 100 to the very end. That's right. And and just to go back to what David was uh, describing, you could you could essentially thought of it this way, David. You're like, well, 125 is 120 plus 5. And you correctly said 120% of 5 is 6. And then you just have to ask yourself, well, what's 5% of 5? And if you multiply 5 times 5 you get 25, not 125. Uh, so that could, have, uh, that could have taken you all the way to the end there. So for this one, uh, I think this is a much more challenging question because first of all, it's a complicated word problem. And second of all, they're asking us to do a conversion from kilometers per hour to miles per hour, which uh, for many understandable reasons, causes a lot of people to panic. A lot of people panic the minute they see, oh, I have to do a conversion from one type of measurement to another. Now, they will always give us the conversion formula. In this case, they are, they're telling us that one kilometer is uh, 0 0.625 miles. But it's up to us to understand that we have to make an inference here that in kilometers per hour, the speed was reduced by 53. So we're going 53 kilometers per hour slower. So the difference is, this is the correct answer in kilometers per hour. This is correct. But the question isn't asking how many kilometers per hour it was reduced, it's asking how many miles per hour it was reduced. So we need to multiply that by 0 0.625 in order to get the answer. So I don't know which part of this question is harder, getting here or solving from here. 
On the GMAT, we shouldn't have to multiply 53 times 0 0.625. That's just not a computation that the GMAT is interested in testing. So it's much more likely that there is some way to pick out the right answer without doing any of the math. And there is such a way. Firstly, can we all agree that C, D, and E can be eliminated because they're too big, right? If we're multiplying 53 times less than 1, that would bring the answer closer to 0, because you're multiplying by a fraction. So it has to be either A or B. Now between A and B, I mean, they're very, they're very close to one another, so you might think, well, I, I can't approximate here, they're just too close. But I think it's significant that one of them is under 30 and the other is above 30. It seems to me like 30 is an important benchmark here. So when I think about the actions that I would take if I did want to do this multiplication, uh, and I think this is where uh, long multiplication is really uh, bad for the GMAT, because with long multiplication, you start on the right-hand side of the solution and you work your way to the left. Whereas the way that I uh, encourage people to multiply uh, lets you start from the left and work your way to the right. And why is that important? Think about our number system. If you have, say, a four-digit number, What's the most important digit? The one all the way on the left or the one all the way on the right? The left. That's right. The further you are to the left in our number system, the more weight that carries because it lets you know uh, approximately where you are in the number line, whereas the stuff on the right-hand side of the number is a lot less important, a lot less significant. And just to illustrate that point, if we have 3,257 versus 3,251. The difference between 7 and 1 seems significant, but when you think about... But when you think about the actual difference between these numbers, it's very minor. On the other hand, if you're looking at 1,257 versus 9,257, that's an enormous difference. So the further we are to the left in the number, the more important uh, that digit is to our, to our number. And so if you've been multiplying the way that I encourage students to multiply, the way you'd think about 53 times 0 0.625 is it's going to start somewhere above 3 on the left-hand side digit. So that eliminates A, and I know that it's B. And I just realized that that whole time you couldn't see the 0 0.625. So there it is. Do you see how useless long multiplication would be in a question? Like with long multiplication, you'd actually have to do the whole thing. You'd have to run through the whole entire algorithm of long multiplication to find out whether it's A or B. But if you're in the habit of multiplying from left to right, which in my opinion is a much more logical method of, of doing it, then you, you don't even have to put pen to paper. You just say, well, it would start on the left-hand side with 5 times 6. It has to be more than 30. It can't be under 30. Now, the way that probably most test prep companies would teach this is they would say, look, you have to memorize, and I don't disagree with them, by the way. They'll say you have to memorize that 0 0.625 is what fraction? Does anybody know? If you happen to know, and I think most people do know, that half is 0 0.5, then half of that, also known as a quarter, would be 0 0.25. So you don't really need to memorize that 0 0.25 is a quarter, you just have to think about the logic. And if you multiply by half again, what's half of 0 0.25? 0 0.125. So, should you just memorize from a flashcard that one eighth is twelve and a half percent? In my opinion, no, you should not memorize it from a flashcard. You should just infer it on your own by doing this kind of thing because that's going to make it a lot uh, like it's going to make make it a lot stickier in your brain. It will make it stick. Uh, and once you know that one eighth is twelve and a half percent, 
do you really need to memorize that 5 eighths is 62 and a half percent? Or would you be better off just saying, look, 5 eighths is half plus 1 eighth. Half is 0 0.5 and 1 eighth is 12 and a half percent. Therefore, it's going to be 62.5 percent. To me, that's a much better, in other words, make yourself a table of the fractions you're supposed to memorize but then infer each of those things that you were supposed to memorize on your own because that's a much better way to memorize them. And that's how I've been teaching my son yeah. the times table. I have never shown him uh, any flashcards of the times table. I just helped him infer every single product from the times table. Uh, and, then, and now he knows how to infer them on his own. And once we've gone through them 150 times, He'll just remember them because he inferred them so many times on his own. So, so that's the advice that I would give people in general for memorizing stuff for the GMAT. And even things like square root of 2, right? Yes, we need to memorize that the square root of 2 is approximately 1.4. We need to have that memorized. But why would we want to memorize that from a flashcard? when we could instead say, look, square root of 2 is the square root of 200 over 100. And the reason I was motivated to write it like that is because then I can pull the 100 out of the square root like that. And why do I like to have a 10 in my denominator? Because of the decimal system. Because then I can just use a decimal point at the end. This goes back to the first question of the day. So now all I have to do is figure out the square root of 200. And since I know that 14 squared is 196, that's one more of those things that we have to memorize. I know 15 squared is 225. Then the square root of 200 must be somewhere in between 14 and 15. And when I stick that, that denominator using a decimal point in the appropriate position, I realize why square root of 2 is approximately 1.4 because it's 14 the square root of 200 is 14 point something so the square root of 2 is 1.4 something and when you memorize the square root of 3 same thing right don't think of it as a square root of 3 think of it as the square root of 300 over 100 and then ask yourself well which perfect squares do I know in the neighborhood of 300 16 17 17. Well, let's see. 17 squared. I don't have that memorized, but I would think of it as 20 minus 3 squared. And now I'm going to use the special product. So that's 20 squared minus 2 times 20 times 3 plus 3 squared. So this part is 120. This part is 400. So what's 400 minus 120 plus 9? That would be 289. So now we know 17 squared is 289. And 18 squared is probably going to be above 300. And if we wanted to check, we would go, okay, 20 minus 2 squared. What's that? That's 20 squared minus 2 times 20 times 2. And guess what? Every time I go through something like this, I get better at the special products. So that's 400 hmm. minus what? 80 plus 4. So 324. Okay, so now we've confirmed that the square root of 300 is somewhere in between 17 and 18. And if we want to divide by 10, because we wanted the square root of 3, we can now say that the square root of 3 is approximately 1.7. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that you would do all of this at the test center. You need to have this memorized before you get to the test center. You need to just know that the square root of 3 is approximately 1.7. But what I'm talking about is how do you get to know that? Do you memorize it from a flashcard or do you force yourself to go through all of that kind of reasoning, thereby improving your, uh, your understanding and your skill level with special products and uh, divisibility and decimal system, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, I'm just gonna interrupt my own video for a moment here. If you're finding value in this video, please let me know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. It really motivates me to keep uploading a new video every day. All right, back to the video.
there's a really important inference to be made at this period that for whatever reason a lot of people don't make. Let me know in the chat box, everyone, did you pause there and infer that uh, for each tool you're making five dollars? With that inference in mind, as we go into the next sentence, there's nothing really interesting in there. I mean, that's kind of how things work in real life, right? But the following sentence, I think we should pause again at the comma. Hey, if we sold 20,000 tools and we know that we're making $5 per tool, that's $100,000 that we made from those 20,000 tools. But, let's not forget we also have a fixed cost, a setup cost of 10,000. So take away the 10,000 and we're left with a profit of 90,000. So that's, I think, a very important inference to make at that comma. Then we keep reading. Company X's gross profit per tool is. So what we have here is a total gross profit. They want it per tool, so we are going to have to divide that by the number of tools, which was 20,000. Reduce the zeros and you're left with nine halves, also known as four and a half. So classic GMAT word problem where if you pause appropriately and make inferences along the way, then by the time you get to the question mark, you're pretty much already done. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.